Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Session Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love group and is part of the Education in Love series. In the Face in My Fear of Action Q&A presentation, Jesus answers questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation, Facing My Fear of Action. Recorded on the 9th of March, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. <sighs> A little bit of Spanish there to liven you up. Okay. Microphone runners are ready. Thank you, guys, girls, I should say. And so our session this time, half an hour we've got, Facing My Fear of Action Q&A. So let's get started on action <coughs> questions. Thanks, Karen. The other day you mentioned when Paul asked about the, um, the parable of the talents, mm -hmm. um, that's kind of been the bane of my life <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. since I was a kid. Um, well, mum and dad? No, no, it's the way I interpreted oh, it. Oh, okay. Sorry um, enough. <laughs> um, they're like, I feel like I've been, I feel like I've been frightened into action. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I can never rest without feeling guilty. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I just, so is the action I need to take about my view of God or is that, not the way you're talking about action. Um, well, no, you, you, you have an issue which is an issue that you're acting in addiction on. Um, so let's just look at it. At the soul level, um, what's going on for yourself, Karen, is that you've, you've decided that the only way for you to get any sense of worth is by taking some action of some kind. Right? This is not the kind of action we're referring to when we're talking about fear of action. Because fear of action, we're defining action as loving action. right? And, and actually what you're doing to yourself is taking an unloving action towards yourself. So from the soul level what's going on is that you've got your soul being driven by an addiction to try to prove itself by acting. And so what you finish up doing is you're driven to do a whole heap of uh, actions from the soul but those actions are not loving to self so therefore they're not loving actions right now of course when you take an action that's unloving so if the direction you're taking is unloving whether it's unloving to yourself or others is immaterial if it's unloving what will the result be it's going to be pain isn't it yep, <laughs> yep which is exactly what you've got right so you ride yourself into the ground right Basically, yeah, you do, and 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 that's be, it's because you're not seeing actually that there, you're taking an unloving action. Now, a person who who lo takes a loving action, the love has to be in harmony of. And remember, I've given this a whole series of talks about love of others, which is one of the very first talks you've ever heard, actually. And then I gave a talk about how to recognise love of self, right? And then we also talked about love of God. Now, now, actions in harmony with love would, would, would consider love of others, love of self and love of God before the action is taken. But you don't do that. You, you're driven by an addiction to take the action. And the addiction is to get approval, a sense of your own sense of approval. Like It's almost you've got this uh, very Catholic guilt-based view of a relationship with God, in that you've got to earn your worth with God, you've got to prove yourself, you've got to do the right thing, but, but it's not driven by love, it's driven by the sense of if, if, if you don't do it, there's a potential that God may firstly disapprove of you, which would be bad enough, but the Catholic view is worse than that, isn't it? That you end up basically in hell, getting punished by God forever, that's the Catholic view which you were brought up with. So, so your view is uh, to avoid the pain of hell, I've got to do as much as I possibly can that's loving without seeing, well, without even measuring love of self. 
And so what you do is you sacrifice yourself and hope there is a loving result afterwards. And there's not going to be. Actually, the choice is between purgatory, which is terrible pain for a very long time, and yeah. hell, which is terrible pain forever. Forever, exactly. Yeah. There's yeah. no other choice. There's no other choice, really, right? Yeah. yeah, and this is what you're brought up with. So, so basically, what you were brought up with, and I, and I see many people in Christian religious faiths brought up, brought up without a concept of love of self. So basically, all they do is consider love of others and love of God, and then they hope that... They, they, that's their view of love and then what they do is they take what they view as a loving action which is actually from God's perspective unloving because you're not considering the third aspect of love which is the love of self right? which is a major problem right? and, and this is where we make a lot of mistakes with love so then we take action which is actually based upon the fear the fear is of God God's disapproval, God's you know, God's punishment, uh, or the disapproval of others and others' punishment, you know, because that's, that's the only things we're considering in this state, just those two pe groups of beings, if you like. So because we're only considering those two, and we're very afraid of what will be the negative consequence of, uh, of an unloving action, well, and, and it has to be their definition of an unloving action, and you don't... You're not considering that actually God's definition of an unloving action is also an unloving action towards oneself. So very important. Now naturally, if you are unloving under God's universe, even if you're unloving to self, there will be pain as a consequence, which is what you're experiencing. Does that make sense? And you also experience exhaustion, and, and you don't, so, so you're not caring for yourself. And in fact, uh, this group is the first time I've actually seen you care for yourself in any way in this group um, there's a few little areas where I could talk to you about how that's evident but but it's it's been the first time I've observed you caring for yourself as well as caring for others you spend a lot of your life caring for others so you're a doctor even and you care for others while they're dying you do care for others quite a lot, right, in your life. And you do care about God's assessment things, but, but you believe God's assessment doesn't include yourself. And that's where the problem is. Yeah. Um, so again, is, is the action that I need to take... Well, the action you're taking is unloving. So inaction is loving or...? Uh, inaction, well, well, what would be the loving thing? If a person's exhausted, what's the loving thing to do? Oh, rest. Yes, that, yeah. <laughs> so the loving action to take is to rest, if you're exhausted. You follow me? And even more loving action would be to work out why you worked yourself to the point of exhaustion. That would even be a more loving thing to do, wouldn't it? To work out what the underlying driving emotion is that causes you to work to exhaustion. That would be an even more loving thing to do. So a person who's exhausted would firstly rest. That's a loving action. They would sustain themselves by you know, looking after themselves physically. And then what they would also do is they'd emotionally address the reason why they, find that they feel guilty about rest, wouldn't they? Because that's the addiction that's driving the unloving action. The unloving action being you're willing to drive yourself in the into the ground in order to please a God that doesn't exist. You know, the punishing God <laughs> who doesn't exist. Only a good God exists. The punishing one doesn't exist. And um, once I've rested enough, the action that is loving to take will, will be more easy to discern no that will only be easy to discern once you've dealt with the emotional reason why you've been doing this for most of your life okay so so you need to look at the emotional reason why you're driving yourself into the ground all the time to the point of exhaustion you do it for your children you do it for other people people you don't even know you do it for as well and, and it's driven not by a pure desire to love them. It's driven by this deep underlying fear, fear associated with beliefs about God. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Makes sense. Yes, uh, Philip, thanks. Over on this side.
uh, soul-based decisions and soul-based changes to the actions that I want to take. Mm -hmm. How can I best determine what my soul t truly desires, given what we've been told about the truth? Well, it's very hard, isn't it? Because because a lot of what we desire is actually out of harmony with love, and a lot of uh, yeah. and so you know that that requires an assessment of a few things first. So, so what I've had to do myself firstly is the, the most loving action you can take Philip, for yourself is to start releasing all of the emotions that have been guiding your past life and decisions. That's the most loving action you can take at this point in time. In the process of doing that, you will become more emotionally sensitive and if you ask for God's love, you'll receive some and you'll become more emotionally sensitive to what love is. Once you become more emotionally sensitive to what love is, then you can choose what love would do and what ones of your desires match what love would do. Does that make sense? So, so basically at the moment many of us are in this process where we... Here's, so here's our soul and the primary influences upon our soul are a lot of unhealed emotions. Let's call them, let's call them like hurt emotions, right? And a lot of facade, which is, which is where we've fabricated a whole heap of uh, concepts about ourselves that are, that are not even true, you follow? So we've got a lot of hurt emotions and a lot of facade. Now, God also created in amongst all of that our real self as well. So there's, there's, there's some real things in our soul too, you know, that's there as well. But unfortunately, it's probably quite covered over by our facade and our hurt. So, so the thing that makes most, most logical sense to do first in terms of developing desire is to develop a desire to remove your facade and develop a desire to feel your hurt. Right? They are the most loving actions you could take for yourself and will cause you the most rapid change as well initially and once you've started dealing with that now when you pray you 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 your real self has the ability is is the only part of yourself that has the ability to pray from god's perspective so when your real self prays you now receive some of god's love and that opens you up and opens you up to some of your internal desires and your internal passions that are also in harmony with that love and now you know what to act upon does that make sense but until you remove the facade and remove the hurt, and this is something we cover in our next like 30 hour, 30 hour sessions, like not next week, but, but in a few months' time, and once, once you deal with those things, you're left with um, the real self who now can make some choices and decisions about what he wants to do. Does that make sense? So the, the best course of action in my, my recommendation, the best course of action is Remove the emotions that create the facade, remove the emotions that create the hurt, then you're left with your real self able to be developed. Now what, what happens in practice though is that you can't remove all of your facade and all of your hurt uh, without, for, without also exposing some of your uh, real self in the process. So what, what re in reality happens is you remove some facade and remove some hurt and then all of a sudden there's a little bit of your real self peek out, right? And, and then you feel, oh, my real self has this desire. And it might be only a small desire or whatever. But, but you ask yourself, is it, is it in harmony with love? Yes, it is. I, I should act upon it. Right? If it's not in harmony with love, then there must be more hurt there that I just need to feel about that. Right? And if I, if I take that approach, in, in the first few years of my life doing that, I'll be really focused on dealing with these two things. But after a while, more and more of my real self will show itself. And more and more of my desires and passions will become clear. And then I, I can see that all of them are in harmony with love, so I act upon them. And the actions that I take will fee give a feedback mechanism and cause me to trigger different emotions that are left over in me, and I deal with those. And then that exposes more of my real self and so forth. And it's like I get more and more and more my real self as I progress then. And then I develop my real self. Like the real self is not given to you by God. It, it's, uh, there's a personality or nature part of it, but you've got complete control over how it develops. And, and you're able to develop it without being influenced by the hurt or the facade then. 
So that would be my suggestion in terms of what action to take. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Okay, any other questions? Right at the back, thanks. Um, I've been telling myself for years that uh, it's no point feeling emotions mm -hmm. because I don't have a desire for God yet. So is this question about emotion or action? Um, taking action on emotion. Okay, fair enough. I think, I think. We'll see if it is. Um, but I've realised that the real reason why I don't want to feel my emotions because I'm afraid of making noise. Made of making noise, yeah. I've gone yeah. out in the middle of nowhere where nobody can hear me mm -hmm. and I'm still afraid of making noise. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, what do you um, do about that? Is yes, it? yes. Okay. It's yep. a bit of a conundrum. Yeah, well, um, obviously the fear of making noise must come from a childhood event or a series of childhood events, right? Now... The choice to not make noise is you living in that fear. Yes. yes. So what you're choosing at the moment is to live in the fear, even when no one's around. Yes. This is the conundrum we face about these unhealed emotions is we don't realise that th the unhealed emotions cause us a lot of difficulties in the long run because what they do is they influence our choices and decisions after that point. So, so what's happening is you've got an emotion inside of you where something happened in your childhood which yeah. caused you to feel that silence was your best option. Yeah, yeah. And you, I even know the events. Of course you do. Yeah. Because yeah, they were violent events, right? Yeah. 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 So, so what you need to do is allow yourself to feel about those events. Okay, right. Yeah. And, and you haven't been allowing yourself to feel those events. What you're trying to do is push through those events. You're yes. trying to ignore them and feel other emotions. Yeah, yeah. I've sort of gone, oh, now I understand where that's come from, so that's okay. Yeah, you, th you, you fall into the trap the same as many do. They, they think that now they think they know what the thing is, then basically it's dealt with. Yes. And that, yeah. that's, th that's not even the first part of yeah. the de deconstruction of the facade. <laughs> you no, know what I mean? It takes no. a whole lot of things yeah. to get down to it emotionally. Yeah. So, so what I'm suggesting to you is allow yourself to go back to those events and mem remember what happened and allow yourself to feel about them. And that will help deconstruct this feeling inside of you that you're going to get badly abused or punished for mm. feeling an emotion. Yeah, yeah. Some of it even came from my mother, as, as you mentioned before. I know, and that's when yeah. the light went on. She lived through the, the war in Europe and there was times when it was really important to either be really quiet or not be who you were. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm starting to see a lot of connections there. There's connections there and you're starting to see them and of course your guides are helping you but the resistance is actually to dealing with emotion yeah. rather than yeah. really taking the action, isn't it? So, so the, the issue is really an issue of your fear of the emotion rather yes. than the fear of action. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay. No Thank worries. You. Uh, Vada, down the front, thanks. Um, so I've got a very similar issue where I'm living at the moment. Um, I, I live in Wilkesdale. I live in my own house, but the, um, the, I've got my own fenced off area. Um, but the owners live like on the same property, but mm -hmm. just a few hundred metres away. And mm -hmm. I've, So I've got the same issue where I, it's like I'm worried about um, making noise and disturbing them. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm feeling more, because I've been there for like a year and three months and I'm feeling that it's just really horrible just bottling everything up all mm -hmm, the time. Mm -hmm. So is there a point though where it's actually unloving? Like um, like if I'm having to feel anger or whatever and it's actually affecting them and bothering them, is that...? Mm. Of course there is a point where it's unloving. Yeah. Of course. So, so what do you do? Um, there's a number of things you can do to be loving in the circumstance, isn't there? Like in terms of helping you feel emotion. But again, I do feel it's a question about emotion, yep. but, but, but let's look at it. If, uh, if, if this is me and I've got a whole series of emotions I need to feel, but, but the people around me are probably going to be pretty disturbed about feeling these particular, me feeling these particular emotions, there are a number of things I can do. Now, some of the things I might do are in addiction and some of the things I might do would, would actually be in love. 
The things I might do in addiction is firstly decide not to do it. Yep. That, that's just trying to please other people rather than work through something that you need to work through. Another thing you could do in addiction is to not bother them at all and decide that every time you're going to feel emotion you have to jump in your car to feel it or whatever. Yeah, that's what I've been doing. That's what you've been doing, yeah. So that's another sort of an addiction to not bother them. Now, there, but there are a number of options you have that are not in addiction. Uh, like you can do something in addiction or not in addiction. You could actually jump in the car and process emotion but it not be an addiction. It just be an act of feeling that you want to love them and not and not bother them. Does that oh, make okay. sense? So it just depends on what the underlying motivation yeah, whereas is. Whereas I've been feeling irritated that I don't feel comfortable at ho just doing it at home. So yeah, I go off sort of in irritation. Yeah. So yeah. that's indication that it's an addiction, right? Yeah. So, so so what we need to do is firstly decide. Okay, and um, there's a number of ways I can handle this, isn't it? In love. Like, into what actions can I take in love? Well, the first thing is I can go to them and inform them that actually I've got a lot of anger to feel and I've got a lot of sadness to feel and there's going to be times when I'm just screaming my head off and there's going to be times when I'm just crying my heart out and you not don't worry about it. Yep. I'm just going to work my way through it. You know, I've been advised to work my way through it. I feel it's the right thing to do. I'm just going to work my way through it. You don't have to worry about it. So, so that allays, firstly, their fear. Secondly, if they're hearing you screaming a lot or getting angry a lot or, cry, you know, or you're crying very loudly in some kind of... Usually if we're crying loudly, it's usually some kind of uh, tantrum um, and not an avoidance of emotion, but sometimes it happens. Um, what you might choose to do then is create a little space inside of the house for you where it's more soundproof, mm. right? And if that, like to me, if that costs me like a thousand dollars or oh, to get a whole heap of sound absorbing materials and make a little booth for me to just run to and have a big ball, where uh, then I'd do that if it was if if I was living right next to somebody in 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 my place in in my place, sorry, I was living in a place that where my bedroom was two meters away from the next bedroom of the next house, right. And uh, so what I used to do is just I uh, used to do um, what Christiana, I think it was mentioned the other day, which is going to was it you that mentioned it going into a built-in robe? Was it, no, it wasn't you. Who was it? Oh, it might have been the last session again. Sorry, I get my sessions better. But what I did is I went into my built-in robe and I had a little sort of soundproofed area there, and I just felt my stuff where I could just do what I needed to do without bothering anybody. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah, I hadn't even thought of that at all. So Why not? Uh, probably due to money issue. Well, I, I don't Well, know. there's two issues I that I see that Maybe you Maybe I don't really want to feel. Well, yeah, well, that makes yeah. three then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I don't know what the other two were then. <laughs> You have a feeling, a very strong feeling, that you want others to uh, share in your experience of emotion. You want oh. you want others to understand what's going on for you, and you want others to, you want others to be involved. Okay, so that's why I haven't sort of. Yeah, so it's like it's like with me that addiction doesn't drive me. I don't want others to be involved in my emotion. I don't need you to know that I'm feeling this or feeling that. So yep. so so I'm perfectly happy to do it in a, a silent in a silent way. Oh, um, okay. Do you understand? You're you're not. You want others to share in the process. Oh. Right? So there's a neediness projected outwards there. And then the second one you've already mentioned which is that you feel frustrated and annoyed that you don't have your space yep. and yet you're not willing to create the space so that yeah. means you want other people to take responsibility for yep. creating a space for you to do it yep. so there's a bit of anger there does that make sense so there's a number of reasons why you haven't even thought of doing it that way yeah it never even crossed my mind yeah you know what i think would be great for the future this would be a great business after a while because it's going to take a while because you know initially there's only going to be one or two buyers but after a while what would be great is a little room that you can build inside of a room and and that's completely soundproof and when you can go in there you can scream at the talking lines and nobody can hear you even in the in the house that'd be nice wouldn't it i reckon that would do a great business eventually if <laughs> if if divine truth ever catches on <laughs> That that would be a great that would be and a great business. And that would be cool if you could pack it away. You could, yeah, like, and, and, like 
against the wall or yeah, something. Yeah, or something like that. Or use it as a bed later or whatever. <laughs> you know, you could come up with some pretty you could come up some pretty inventive ways to handle this. But um to me, um yes, if you're impacting upon other people's lives by feeling your emotion, then you're already being unloving anyway. Yeah. And you'd got to you've got to consider why you're choosing to do that, which often is a is a feeling of anger. Uh, of not wanting to take responsibility, want others to be involved, want others to take up responsibility for how I feel and so forth. Yep. Yeah. So anger drives those kind of decisions. Yep. Thank yep. you. Okay. Um, if we go right up to Judith at the back. Thanks. Hi. If a person is fatigued all the time, is it me not just feeling my fear and the emotions behind the fear? Um, fatigue can be caused by the suppression of all sorts of emotions, Judith, not just fear. Fear obviously is a big part of it, but, uh, but you could be suppressing shame, for example, or some other emotion, sadness. It, it just depends on what emotion you're suppressing that causes exhaustion. Um, exhaustion, very similar. Eventually, if you live in it, it can turn into depression, right? Um, because we're trying to suppress our emotional state, basically suppress it all. So what I would do is there is look at, you know, take some action in terms of looking at your, um, your underlying belief systems about emotion itself. Does that make sense? Like, what do you believe about emotion? You see it as a weakness? You see it as a place of powerlessness? You feel others will manipulate you if you allow others to feel that you're emotional about different things. You know, what are your feelings? You need to analyse what are your feelings for yourself and find out what your blockages to feeling emotion is and what your blockages to taking action on the, on the subject are. Does that make sense? Yes. So a lot, a lot of our work is about our resistance, right? We have resistances. <coughs> And we need to overcome them. You've got to make sure, though, that a lot of these resistances are not just stories you're telling yourself so that you don't have to feel something that's painful. Right? Those kind of resistances don't have to be felt. They're just stories you've fed yourself. The resistances that have to be felt are the resistances that were created in your childhood as a result of your family of origin suppressing the, ex the experience of emotion. So these kind of resistances are things like fear of violence, fear of attack, fear of being laughed at and ridiculed and so forth. These are more soul-based resistances that are caused by our underlying uh, history, you know, the, the childhood history. So that's where I would go. Thank Find you. your resistances from your childhood history. That'll, that'll open you up to the experience, yeah.